Welcome to lecture zero of information theory. Uh, in this video, I'll go over some of the prerequisites uh, for this course, uh, which, which is mainly basic concepts and probability. Uh, I'll, I'll cover some of that uh, in this video and uh, hope that uh, you'll refresh some of the things that you've already learned in your pro probability course. So in case, so you can, uh, as a reference, you can use whatever textbook you used for your probability and random processes course. Uh, but these two books are also pretty good. Uh, the first is uh, the book by Papolis. Uh, it's titled Probability, Random Variables and Stochastic Processes. There's also the book by Sheldon Ross uh, titled Introduction to Probability Models. But of course, these are just two such references. You can use whatever reference you like. So in this lecture, uh, uh, I want to go over some of the basics, but uh, I hope that you are already familiar with the following concepts in probability. So, so basically, what is a random variable? What are discrete and continuous random variables? What is a probability mass function of a discrete random variable? And what is the probability density function of a continuous random variable? What is the cumulative distribution function? Uh, and and notions of the base rule and independence of random variables. What is, what do you mean by the expectation of a random variable? Conditional expectation and properties of expectation, and the mean and variance and higher order moments and the moment generating function. And and I hope that you are familiar with commonly seen distributions such as Bernoulli, binomial, Poisson, uh, uniform, Gaussian, chi-square, and so on. So, if you are fully comfortable with these concepts, then you're, you're, we're good to go. But if not, then please stop watching this video and, and go through these basics first. So, another uh, sort of fundamental result in probability theory, uh, which, which, which of course you would have seen in, in your course, uh, is the so-called union bound and it's something that we will use very frequently in information theory. So the union bound gives a bound on the probability of the union of two events. Right? So suppose that I have two events A and B. So what is the probability of occurrence of the union of these two events, right? So, for example, uh, let's suppose that I am rolling a die, right? And uh, event A is is the event that we get an odd number, right? And let's say that event B uh, is the event that the number is less than or equal to 3. Okay. Now, this is a very simple example and you can exactly calculate the probability that uh, we see A union B. Right? So, so, A union B would be the probability that it is either odd or the number is less than or equal to 3. So, so basically that would be 1, 2, 3 and 5. Right? And, and we know that the probability is, is 4 by 6. So this is a very simple example. But there are more complicated instances where we can't explicitly compute the probability of A union B, but we have a handle on the probabilities of A and B. The union bound is a nice trick and it basically says that the probability of A union B is less than or equal to the probability of occurrence of event A plus the probability of occurrence of event B. Uh, and you would have already seen in your probability course that, that in fact the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. And, and kind of one way of seeing why this is true is to look at this Venn diagram representation of events. 
So if I represent this set as A and this set as B, so these two, two are the events, then A union B is the union of these two sets, which is basically this region over here. And we know that this is of this is less than or equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And, and this, so this is a very useful inequality and we'll keep using this uh, frequently in the course. So the next result, very important result is Markov's inequality. So So very frequently what we want is the probability that uh, so, so we want so called tail bounds. What do I mean by a tail bound? So any probability of the form probability x greater than a for some value of a or the probability that x minus mu where mu denotes the mean of a uh, is greater than a. So these are called tail probabilities uh, and the reason is the following so if so suppose that this uh, you have some kind of a probability density function which looks something like this then then sometimes you are interested in the probability that x is greater than some particular value which is this region over here right? which is basically this area under the probability density function. And these are typically small, uh, we are generally interested in the probability that x greater than a for some slightly large value of a right? and, and, and very frequently we are interested in getting a bound on these tail probabilities. For complicated uh, distributions, it is generally hard to compute such probabilities exactly, but we want some general techniques. Uh, which are easy to compute, so easy bounds which we can use uh, depending on our application. Right, so, so these are so called tail bounds and we will see a couple of them over here. Sometimes some of these uh, also are used to, to prove so, so called concentration inequalities and uh, the concentration inequality basically says that the probability that uh, uh, certain events or, or so, uh, the probability that a certain event is happening is tends to 1. So that is called a concentration inequality because all the probability gets concentrated in some small region. But anyway, so what we are interested in is, is getting these tail bounds and what Markov's inequality says is that if we have a non-negative random variable x. Then for any positive a, the probability that x is greater than a, greater than or equal to a, is always upper bounded by the mean divided by a, where mean is the expected value of a. Right? So here we are assuming that the mean is strictly positive. But you can see that this, this also holds. Uh, if it is a non-negative random variable and the mean is equal to 0, then, then think about what would happen. Would, would, uh, does, the prob the, does the random way or does the distribution put positive mass anywhere beyond 0? Think about that. Right. So of course the natural question is why would you want uh, to see such an inequality? What is the benefit of having an inequality of this form, well in certain cases you do not know what the exact distribution of the random variable or, or even computing uh, such probabilities is difficult. So, so, so this is a very nice uh, bound on the probability of a tail event 
uh, which which is which expresses this in terms of just the mean so as long as you know the mean of the random variable this bound always holds even if you don't know the exact distribution so so that's pretty useful so for example if i tell you that uh, if, if i say that i have a die right and i don't know the exact the die is not uh, a fair die it's loaded so in the sense that if i roll the die then i don't get each number with probability exactly 1 by 6 maybe for some numbers it is slightly above 1 by 6 and for certain numbers it is uh, slightly below 1 by 6 but i don't know what the exact distribution is but if i know the mean so if i keep rolling the die and i and, and, and somehow i get a handle on the mean then i can obtain probabilities of this form or, or a bound on the probability of this form using just the mean right so, so that come that may come uh, pretty handy right so so the markov's inequality is a pretty useful technique and and in fact we'll use the markov's inequality to prove many other such tail bounds right so in just a bit i'll use markov's inequality to prove more inequalities for more general random variables but let but first let's see a proof of markov's inequality so this course will involve a lot of uh, proofs and derivations so let's start with our first let's start with the first non trivial proof uh, of this course so, so the trick to proving Markov's inequality is to first start with the expectation of the mean, the formula for the mean and then uh, try to uh, make some modifications to that. Right? So the mean of the random variable is the expected value of x uh, and, and what is this equal to? So let's assume that x is continuous valued. Uh, you can prove this similarly for a discrete valued random variable. So the mean of the random variable is integral 0 to infinity of x f of x dx where f of x is the probability density function of x right and and why can i and why do i take the limits of the integral only from 0 to infinity so i take it on from 0 to infinity because uh, it's a non-negative random variable, right? So, so x never takes value below zero. So now what I'll do is that I'll split this integral into two parts. So first, the integral from zero to a, x f of x dx, plus integral a to infinity, x f of x dx. Right? But, but what do I know about the first term over here? So this term is always greater than or equal to 0. Am I right? I want you to pause the video and think about why this is true. So this is greater than or equal to 0 because every term, uh, the, uh, so, so the integrand is always greater than or equal to 0. Right? So x is x is non-negative and f of x is a probability density function so that is also non-negative so, so, so the integral is greater than or equal to 0 and therefore this is greater than or equal to integral a to infinity x f of x dx okay so now that i have this uh, how do i further simplify note that this is the boxed equation inequality is what I want to get. So, so note that if you look at the integral x f of x, uh, so you are taking the limit from a to infinity, right? So this is always greater than or equal to integral a to infinity a f of x, right? Because in this in this region from a to infinity, x is always greater than or equal to a. And f of x is non negative. Right? So this is a f of x dx. And if I, and I can take the a outside. But, but what is this integral equal to? Right? It's, 
I want you to pause the video and, and think about what it is equal to. So this is equal to integral a times the probability that x is greater than or equal to a. Right? Okay, so, that, so we basically got everything we need. So mu is greater than or equal to a times the probability that x is greater than or equal to a. And if I rearrange this, I get probability x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to mu over a. Right? Okay. So, as a simple exercise, uh, what I want you to do is take a simple example, let us say rolling of a die. And, and for this example, uh, compute the mean and for a equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, compute uh, this upper bound, the probability, uh, compute mu over a, right? And also compute the probability that x is greater than or equal to a, okay? And, and see what happens. Uh, see how, what you get as the Marcos using Marcos inequality and compare it with the actual probabilities. All right, so we've seen Markov's inequality and let's now quickly see another inequality which is similar. So Markov's inequality is valid only for non-negative random variables, right? So let's obtain a similar inequality but for general random variables. The inequality here will not be, will be of a slightly different form. So what we have is So what we call Chebyshev's inequality. So let's suppose that we have a random variable x. So it need not be non-negative. It could take negative values also. And uh, it has mean equal to mu. Uh, no constraints except that this is finite. And let's suppose that the variance is also finite. Right? Uh, and uh, recall what is the definition of the variance it is the expectation of x minus mu the whole squared. So let me call the variance sigma squared. So I'm assuming that both the mean and the variance are finite and, and of course they're known to us and, and we don't really need to know uh, the exact distribution of x. Right? So what Chebyshev's inequality says is that the probability that the absolute value of the difference between x and the mean is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to sigma square divided by a square. So, so this what this says is that the probability that a random variable x, any random variable x deviates from its mean by a is, is always upper bounded by sigma square by a square. So if, if a is reasonably large, then the probability that it deviates from the mean is, is, is pretty small. Right? So it's inversely proportional to a square. Right? Uh, so, so one very simple application of this is, is for example, to find such a probability for a Gaussian random variable. So uh, recall the definition of a Gaussian random variable. Uh, a Gaussian is has a probability density function. Pro uh, a Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma square has density square root 2 pi sigma square times e to the minus x minus mu the whole square by 2 sigma square. Right? And, and exactly computing the probability that uh, mod x minus mu is greater than or equal to a is pretty hard. Now, although uh, there are better bounds known, the Chebyshev's inequality gives a very simple bound on the probability that uh, x deviates from the mean. So, if you look at a Gaussian, it looks something like this. Uh, 
so the problem so if this is the mean mu right so so this problem the probability that mod x minus mu is greater than or equal to a is the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to a or x minus mu uh, or, or yeah, x minus mu is less than or equal to minus a so this this is mu and if you look at the points mu plus a and mu minus a then then this probability over here this probability over here is the prob is is this probability plus this probability right so that so that's the probability that we are interested in okay and chebyshev's inequality says that this probability is always less than or equal to sigma square by a square okay let's see how to prove chebyshev's inequality the proof is fairly simple we are going to it's just an application of markov's inequality but you need to know which random variable to apply markov's inequality on so so if i try to directly apply markov's inequality on mod x minus mu i'm going to run into trouble because i don't know how to express uh, the expectation of x minus mu in terms of mu or sigma square right so so what i'll do is first i'll make the observation that the probability that mod x minus mu is greater than or equal to a is equal to the probability that x minus mu the whole square is greater than or equal to a square so so why can i say that this is exactly equal i can say that these are exactly equal because uh, mod x minus mu and a are both non negative so these two probabilities are exactly equal x minus mu the whole square is a non negative random variable and therefore i can use markov's inequality so this is using markov's inequality this is less than or equal to the expectation of x minus mu the whole square divided by a square but what is expectation of x minus mu the whole square by a square it's sigma square by a square So this is sigma square by a square. Here I just use the definition of variance, right? So this is a very nice inequality which you can use for any random variable. So whenever we want to say that a certain tail probability is small, we'll generally invoke Chebyshev inequality or or, or some similar inequality. Now, although the Chebyshev's inequality is nice, it's it's generally not a tight bound. So it's not tight in the sense that the actual probability is 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 generally much smaller than sigma square by a square, right? And and in such cases, we want better or or more stronger inequalities. which leads us to what is called the Chernoff bound. Okay, so, so the Chernoff bound is another such inequality and it says the following. So if x is a random variable, with mean mu which is finite and and let's assume that all the moments exist then
for every positive a we have the probability that x is greater than or equal to mu plus a is always less than or equal to it's a complicated looking thing it's the minimum overall t greater than 0 of the expected value of e to the t times x minus mu divided by e to the t times a and similarly the probability that x is less than or equal to mu minus a is less than or equal to the minimum overall t positive of the expectation of e to the minus t times x minus mu divided by e to the t times a. Okay. And once again this is going to be an application of Markov's inequality. So, so note that so we have Markov's inequality which in itself is, is, is usually not very tight. Uh, it, is, it is generally loose for many random variables. But, but by applying Markov's inequality on suitably modified versions of random variables, we get very nice bonds. So, so let's look at, so, so how do we prove this result? So we have, so I'll only prove the first part. So let's start with probability of x greater than or equal to mu plus a, right? So now x is not a non-negative random variable. So I need to somehow get a non-negative random variable from this, right? So and, and I also need to bring in this t. So let's consider any positive t. I know that this is always equal to the probability that t times x is greater than or equal to t times mu plus a, right? I've done nothing fancy here. I just multiplied both the left and the right hand side of the inequality by a positive number t. Now, for any t greater than 0. So this is equal to the probability that e to the tx is greater than or equal to e to the t times mu plus a, right? And, uh, and, and why can I say this? I want you to pause the video and tell me why this is a valid statement. So this is valid because e to the x is, is an increasing function of x. Right? It's an increasing function. So, so a is always great. So, alpha is always greater than or equal to beta. Sorry. So, e to the alpha is greater than or equal to e, e to the beta if and only if alpha is greater than or equal to beta right okay so now that i have this i can directly apply so e to the tx is non negative and therefore i can apply markov's inequality so this is less than or equal to the expectation of e to the tx divided by e to the t times mu plus a by Markov's inequality, right? And just by simplifying this, I get expectation of e to the t times x minus mu divided by e to the t times a, right? Now this is true for all t. So, so this set of inequalities is valid for every positive t. So in particular, this should also be valid for the minimum of this overall possibility. So it's valid for all t greater than 0 
and this implies that the probability that x minus mu or the probability that x is greater than or equal to mu plus a is less than or equal to the minimum for all t greater than 0 of the expected value of e to the t times x minus mu divided by e to the t times a right so so this this in general is is pretty tight it's, it's a good bound it's much better than uh, chebyshev's inequality but unfortunately computing this is hard so firstly this is a complicated function of t you have to find the moment generating function the numerator is obviously the moment generating function and and then you have to minimize over all possibility right so so in general this is difficult but in many applications so so one never uses this direct version of the chernoff bound but in fact some simplification or some bound on the chernoff bound is used in practice okay so so these three inequalities that you, that we've seen markov chebyshev and uh, the chernoff bound are are pretty good in themselves but are even more useful for sequences of random variables rather than individual random variables themselves so let's look at sequences of random variables so let us suppose that we have random variables x1 x2 x3 up to xn which are independent and identically distributed they denote iid so so this means that if if the random variables are continuous then their joint density is equal to the product of the marginal densities fxn if they are discrete random variables then their joint pmf is equal to the product of the individual pmfs and moreover each of the marginal pmfs or the pdfs are the same so that is what is meant by independent and identically distributed random variables right so so the random variables are all mutually independent not just pairwise independent uh, and they are all identically distributed so their marginal distributions are all the same okay and so for example uh, so so can you think of an example of independent and identically distributed random variables so one example is let's suppose that we have a coin uh, a fair coin i toss it n times right i toss it once i get something i note it down i toss it a second time i note down what i get i toss it a third time note down what i get so so this so the first time the second time the third time they're all independent tossings of the coin and they're all identically distributed because i'm tossing the same coin so this is an example of independent and identically distributed random variables right and and what we're interested in is is kind of the average behavior of the random variables so suppose that all of these are random variables and what i'm interested in is the random variable y which is 1 over n times i going from 1 through n xi right so the average of the random variables it's not the mean but but the empirical average of the n random variables so very frequently we are interested in quantities of this form and and in fact we can use markov chebyshev and uh, the chernoff bound to 
to also obtain bonds uh, on Y, right? So, as a simple application, uh, let's try to apply Markov's inequality on uh, Y, and I encourage you to to try doing this uh, uh, for both the Chernoff bound and the Chebyshev inequality as well. So I have Y, and what I want to know is the probability that the empirical average from i going from 1 through n of x i is greater than or equal to a right and right so so i want a bound on the sum right on, on the sum divided by n and and now of course i'll assume that the x i's are all uh, non negative random variables so this is less than or equal to by markov's inequality the expectation of y divided by a but what is the expectation of y equal to expectation of y is expectation of 1 over n times the sum of all the xi's but by linearity of expectation this is 1 over n times sum i going from 1 through n of expectation of xi which is simply the expectation of x1 for example right and this is equal to mu x1 divided by a so the mean of x1 divided by a because they are all independent and identically distributed right so in particular if if, in, if instead i am interested in the probability that the sum of all the xi's is greater than or equal to alpha for some number alpha then so alpha is basically n times a over here so this is less than or equal to mu x1 divided by n times a right so the probability that the sum dba is, is greater than or equal to alpha decays as 1 over n right so similarly you can get bounds on the probability that the average deviates from the mean for arbitrary random variables right so if i have if x1 through xn are arbitrary random variables with finite mean and variance then the probability that a 1 through n xi minus mu So probably this is greater than or equal to a right so what do we have for this just by using uh, Chebyshev's inequality this is less than or equal to sigma square so it is the variance of 1 over n I going from 1 through n of xi divided by a squared but the variance is simply 1 over n times n times the variance of x1 divided by a square so this is the variance of x1 divided by a squared Right. And similarly, you can derive a Chernoff bound, but but the Chernoff bound is is again it's a complicated function. But uh, in fact, you can simplify the Chernoff bound for certain specific random variables. So the following result is pretty useful, uh, not just in information theory, but but many other problems of computer science and so on. So if if x one through xn are iid bernoulli random variables so suppose that they're all bernoulli p random variables then you can prove the following the probability that 1 over n sum i going from 1 through n of xi so probability that this is greater than or equal to what is the mean the mean is p p 
times 1 plus delta. So here delta is a small number which is greater than or equal to 0. So this is less than or equal to e to the minus delta square np divided by 3. Right. So and similarly the probability that 1 over n some i going from 1 through n of x i is greater than or sorry is less than or equal to p times 1 minus delta is less than or equal to e to the minus delta square n p divided by 3. Right? So I won't give a proof of this. Uh, I leave this to you as an exercise. But uh, some of the steps are outlined in the lecture notes that uh, I'll be posting in the web page. So if I combine these two, I get so the probability that mod 1 over n i equal to 1 through n xi minus p e is greater than or equal to delta times p is less than or equal to what is this less than or equal to i want you to pause the video and try to get this using the above two inequalities okay so so now if i call this event as a and this event as b then you should be able to see that this event over here is simply the union of these two okay so that's something you should see and therefore using the union bound i should i should get that this is the probability of less than or equal to the probability of a plus probability of b which is less than or equal to 2 times e to the minus delta square n p divided by 3. So this is a much stronger bound than say Chebyshev's inequality and, and, and I want you to as an exercise I want you to do this to bound this using Chebyshev's inequality. And see what happens for large n. So for n very large, you see that of course both of them, both of the bounds tend to 0 as n tends to infinity, but, but see the growth in terms of n. So here this, this decays exponentially in n, but, but you will see that if you try to do Chebyshev's inequality, then it is in fact not exponential, it is much slower than that. So with this we will end this video, we will continue with some uh, more probability basics in the next video.